Yesterday marked the third anniversary of one of the worst environmental crises in history. The world was stunned by horrifying images of the massive tsunami that hit the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant and caused the subsequent meltdown of its reactors. Now, three years later, there are still several unanswered questions regarding how the nuclear leak will be contained and what the long-term effects of the radiation will be for the Pacific Ocean and atmosphere. So to help me break this down, I'm joined by Kevin Camps, radioactive waste watchdog of beyondnuclear.org, and Tim Judson, executive director of the Nuclear Information and Research Center. Thank you so much for coming on, Thanks. both of you. Thank you. Um, Tim, I want to start with you. Uh, the news that J Japanese officials at Fukushima may soon make a controlled dump of hundreds of thousands of tons of radioactive waste in the, in the Pacific Ocean. But TEPCO already admitted that 300 tons is already leaking every day. Mm -hmm. I mean, what difference does it make at this point? Uh, well. It makes a big difference. Um, I mean, first of all, the reason that they're doing this is because essentially they haven't been able to mitigate those other, you know, the, the, the groundwater flow through the site where they've got these 300 tons going out into the ocean every day. Um, this water that they've been storing in these tanks has ostensibly been filtered, but is still really contaminated. And the idea that they're just going to, you know, start dumping that water wholesale into the ocean is just a sign that, they're com that the priorities here are completely off. Uh, right now, the Japanese government is uh, diverting billions and billions of dollars and, you know, and, and untold government resources into trying to restart their other 48 reactors, uh, you know, when they don't have this situation under control. And that's just a really misplaced set of priorities. Kevin, let's take a look at this animation created by the National. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration showing the radioactive particles, of course, in the wake of the disaster. How should we interpret this now? Um, and with the way the climate functions, where did this radiation go? Well, my understanding is this image from the National Oceanic, NOAA for short, <laughs> is from March of 2011. Mm -hmm. It shows atmospheric releases, 75% of which did fall out on the Pacific Ocean. But as you mentioned, uh, it's been an ongoing leak. Uh, 72,000 gallons per day of radioactive groundwater going into the Pacific. So this is an unprecedented catastrophe for the Pacific Ocean, but those atmospheric releases reached North America within just days. One of the figures that sticks in my head was Boise, Idaho, April 2011, radioactive iodine-131, which is a vicious radioactive poison that attacks the thyroid gland, at levels 242 times the Safe Drinking Water Act. So in Virginia, in the first days of this catastrophe, the state of Virginia warned people not to drink rainwater. So this is a global catastrophe. And it's ongoing, of course, or, or has it dissipated? It well, it's ongoing in the terms of the 300 tons per sure. day going into the ocean, but the hundreds of thousands of tons that they would dump, uh, tritium is in there, and it's very difficult to remove. But a colleague of ours, Dr. Arjun Makajani, has proposed bringing in a super tanker, getting the wastewater off of that fragile, vulnerable site, taking it somewhere else to deal with, instead of just dumping it in the ocean like it's a giant sewer or and, something. And I think that's really the thing that confuses people the most is where is this going? I mean, it's going to the Pacific Ocean. It can go all over the world. Uh, it's terrifying people who are seeing these doomsday predictions. Um, Tim, there's the question over the safety of seafood. All we're hearing is either don't eat it. You have nothing to worry about. Can you give us any sort of insight on what we should be doing about seafood from the Pacific? Sure. So um, there is some amount of testing that's going on, although much less than what people think should actually be happening. Um, the, right now, the, the, the levels that, um, that they're detecting in seafood are, you know, are, are, you know, within permissible limits. Um, the problem is, is that, you know, what's permissible and the, the, what's permissible in the U.S. is about 10, the standards in the U.S. are about, uh, allow radiation levels that are about 10 times higher than what's considered safe in Japan right now. And so, um, you know, it's really up to people to decide what they're comfortable with. Um, I think really the, the point to underline here is that, you know, this kind of radioactivity, especially the really harmful radioisotopes that, that are at issue here, don't occur naturally in fish. They're coming from Fukushima, they're coming from Chernobyl, they're coming from atomic weapons testing. And people shouldn't have to worry about this. And the fact of the matter is, you know, that we, the, you know, the, we can't stop eating, but we can stop nuclear power. Very well said. Uh, Kevin, and, and you just kind of outlined where the radiation went, um, where it is now, but for people who are very concerned on the West Coast, I mean, is that overblown in terms of the threat to radiation continuously with rainfall and stuff on the West Coast right now? Well, um, an issue that's just happening now is three years on, the radioactive plume in the ocean is reaching the West Coast of North America. It's already hit the Canadian shores of the Gulf of Alaska. It's moving down to Seattle probably next month. And by summer, it'll go further south, the California coast, for example. What this is doing, as Tim said, is it's adding to artificial radioactivity 
in the background. And every exposure that we have to radioactivity is harmful to our health. There's no safe dose. There's no threshold below which it's not harmful. So we're just adding to this burden. And in the food chain, in the seafood supply, for example, bioconcentration, where these artificial radioactive poisons build up in the, in the food chain, and we sit on top of that food chain. Right, we're already getting enough radiation as it is. We don't need to continue piling it up <laughs> and worrying about this, Tim. There's so much disinformation as we're talking mm -hmm. about. Where do you guys go to find the most reliable sources about the disaster? Um, there, are, you know, there are different you know, blogs and websites that are doing good sort of filtering of the bad information that's out there. Um, for instance, there is, uh, you know, uh, END e &D News is a good source. Um, there's, there, there's some other ones out there. We actually post a lot of the good stuff to our website, so people can go there. Uh, to find, you know, what's really the trustworthy information. Great. Do you have anything to add with uh, advice? You know, given that's the third anniversary of Fukushima, I've been rereading things like the Japanese Parliament investigation report, and there's incredible revelations in there. And Tokyo Electric, of all uh, companies, will every once in a while admit that six months ago, the figure they gave, well, you need to double that. So what we're trying to do is keep track of the admissions by Tokyo Electric, by the Japanese government. And that's kind of a minimum. We really can't trust their data. And then groups like safecast.org are doing tremendous work on the ground in Japan. It's spreading to other countries, including the United States, verifying what the radiation levels are through independent monitoring. I think that's really where we have to rely on because, as we know, TEPCO has been grossly incompetent, criminally negligent and up to a certain point. I mean, it's shocking. Um, m mice chewing through the wire. I mean, <laughs> it's just like, and it's absurd. Kevin, the U.S. has 104 nuclear reactors, at least 22 of which are near identical designs that the GE reactors in Fukushima. This, coupled with the near impossible task of actually removing the waste, storing it safely, why is scaling back nuclear energy not a more pressing concern in this country? Well, I think there's some good news. A record-breaking year in terms of reactor shutdowns, five reactor shutdowns in the U.S., including Vermont Yankee, which is a Fukushima Daiichi twin, will be shut down by the end of this year. As Prime Minister Khan said in Japan, though, it's a huge fight. In Japan, it's the most powerful political and economic lobby, he said, the nuclear industry. In the United States, it's one of the most powerful. So that's what the grassroots movement is up against, are these billion-dollar corporations that own Capitol Hill, own the White House, and all too often own the courts as well. Yeah. And, and the implication of that here is actually, you know, really concerning because, um, you know, the, one of the things that's happening right now is that the, the Federal Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is responsible for setting safety standards in the U.S., is actually backing off of safety standards right now out of financial concern for the U.S. nuclear industry. And they're making a choice that it's better to have unsafe reactors operating than to have increased safety standards and have some of these things shut down. Oh, so they're, they're kowtowing to the industry as well. I just think that if Japan can't even commit to, to shutting down nuclear power. I mean, what chance do we have? I mean, look at what happened there. What, what is it going to take? Well, the miracle in Japan is that for the, for the past three years, they have 48 still operable reactors. Four were destroyed at Fukushima Daiichi. Two more were retired there because the site's so radioactive. Six dead reactors. They have 48 still operable, and this huge groundswell of public opposition unseen before in Japan with protests of 250,000 people at the prime minister's residence. Mm -hmm. They have kept all those 48 shut down thus far. So the fight is on. Prime Minister Abe, very pro-nuclear. The people of Japan, a majority saying no more of this stuff. And, you know, the same is happening here in places like Vermont. Good, good. Uh, and Tim, of course, there's no immediate solution. As we've seen, it's just been a complete disaster ongoing. But in your mind, what's the best case scenario for Fukushima? We have about a minute left. Uh, sure. Well, I think the best case scenario for Fukushima is that the Japanese government, you know, sort of gets religion on this and decides to, you know, to stop pushing for new reactors, really dedicates their resources uh, to getting this accident under control. And, you know, and, and that's really, I think, where we've got to start. What do you think? Renewables are the future, and Prime Minister Khan, who served during the catastrophe, is now a global leader in the anti-nuclear movement. He introduced solar PV legislation, a feed-in tariff that has been hugely successful. So solar PV is growing by leaps and bounds in Japan. Germany has sworn off nuclear power through renewables and efficiency. That's it, the future. It's possible, and it's time that we start doing that. You guys, thank you so much for coming in, breaking down some of the dis disinformation. Tim Judson, Executive Director at Nuclear Information and Research Center. Kevin Camps, Radioactive Waste Watchdog at beyondnuclear.org. Really appreciate both of you coming on. Thank you.